thanks for those kind words of introduction. And uh, thank you very much, Mark, and the organizing committee for arranging such a magnificent celebration of Athena's life. I think we're all deeply touched already by seeing the evidence of the impact of her work uh, on uh, understanding the nature of both addiction and depression. And I'm going to kick off a session here where we're, we're going to uh, think deeply about her other major contributions, which was to really uh, influence the way in which we think about animal models in the context of uh, drug discovery. Um, Igor spoke about uh, Athena as being a doer. Uh, and this is the element of her work that I think really demonstrates that very, very concretely. Uh, some of you may know that uh, about, I guess it was eight years ago nearly, uh, just as the crisis of uh, the, the withdrawal of drug companies uh, supporting research in uh, CNS drug development, uh, ACMP struck a task force called the, uh, the Medication Development Task Force uh, to try to address this issue. <clears throat> And there was a subcommittee, uh, which was called the Subcommittee on Animal Models of CNS Drug Development. And Athena put herself forward to be the chair of that committee. Um, and those of you who may have seen the, the really wonderful uh, review uh, version of neuropsychopharmacology in 2009, which dealt with many of these issues, will, will know that uh, Athena's hand was in a lot of this work. Uh, and so I'm taking uh, uh, that uh, paper that she contributed to, uh, and uh, I'm going to use this to uh, share a few ideas with you. Before I get to that, though, I wanted to just remind ourselves of the work that uh, Athena and, and Mark had done over the years, just on uh, reminding us about the importance of animal models and starting with a definition, which is any experimental preparation developed in an animal for the purpose of studying a human condition. And they also reminded us that there are no perfect animal models. Uh, for CNS uh, disorders, as implied by the use of the term modeling, um, and that one needs to be aware of the strengths and the weaknesses of, of, of this approach. But nevertheless, it was also implicit that this is a fundamentally important uh, aspect of drug development. And so in this paper that I'm referring to that she wrote in, in conjunction with the other authors listed here, including Mark, um, this is really a marvelous paper. Uh, and it lays out the important issues that we're still grappling with when we think about the importance of animal models in drug development. Um, and what I'm going to do is just pick a few. This is the layout of the, of the paper. It's, it's key sections and then the uh, areas that it deals with. I'm going to go through this quickly because I think that this is, the, this is the framework that we need. It's just as current today as it was in 2009. We've made some progress. But we need to keep this in mind when we think about how we're going to use this amazing resource to eventually find those new drugs that are going to um, be effective in treatment of mental ill health, including addiction. Um, so this paper starts off reminding us that there was a time when we felt that the major discoveries we were making in molecular neuroscience would give us the targets and the drug candidates and that we would be able to come up with highly specific magic bullets that would um, facilitate CNS drug discovery. Of course, those promises have yet to um, pay the dividend, but nevertheless, I think it's still uh, something that many of us aspire to. But it's also, it contains in it a hidden, a hidden flaw, and that is that these disorders that we're trying to understand and treat are so complex that they're probably impervious to magic bullets. And we need to accept the fact that in a time, especially 10 years ago, of high throughput screening, where we were reluctant to invest in um, in vivo whole brain models of disease, we probably were oversimplifying the, the whole endeavor. And that we really needed to um, find new ways forward. Other elements in here uh, included the fact that um, biomarkers, of course, were playing an important role and would in and would continue to be the case. And so we're always searching for the appropriate biomarker or endophenotype that might be the intermediary that would allow us to know whether or not our hypothesis and our new drug was really impacting uh, the right um, neural processes and uh, psychological functions. 
This paper also speaks of something called a feed-forward loop. And this is uh, uh, an admission of the fact that uh, drug discovery is, is a social endeavor. And there are people involved who champion these programs. And uh, as the program develops, uh, there's probably an over-reliance on uh, being committed to a particular program and looking forward to try to, endeavor to ensure that it continues at a time when it probably might seriously be considered for uh, cessation. Um, sorry, coming back into uh, this, the, the role or lack of models of, of, of drug profiling, th this was a plea for that as the entire enterprise of drug development, looking at all aspects of profiling, including eventual marketing, that the importance of the animal modeling at the early stages of this be integrated into a drug profiling um, endeavor. The paper then goes on, and this is a very important part, about talking about the gold standard reference compound and its role in drug discovery. And again, this is a two-edged sword. When you do have drugs that are effective, uh, such as the antidepressants and perhaps uh, some aspects of uh, psychotic drug uh, use, um, this becomes the, uh, the standard to which everything else has to compare. And of course, that drug may work only in a particular way, and it can also retard the development of, of new compounds and, and new ideas. So it's both a pro and a con that has influenced uh, this, this process. The paper also speaks about the unidirectional flow as an impediment to improve predictions from animal models. And here again, I think the paper is making a seminal point about the fact that when you're developing an animal model for understanding a complex neural uh, or medical disorder, in this case neural, it should really be a two-way street. It's not just the development of an idea that comes from an understanding of basic neuroscience. So we get the, the pr proof of concept in an animal and it moves forward magically into a human trial. There has to be a culture of co-exchange between the basic research community and also those that are on the front line uh, clinically. And the insights that the clinician can provide are extremely important, and also the deep insights that the basic scientist has in order to influence clinical decision making is also part of this whole equation. So instead of it being unidirectional, really effective animal model development has to be bidirectional. And then finally, looking to the future, um, the paper asks, how can animal models contribute effectively to drug discovery? Uh, and um, the real, uh, the part of the paper that I like the most, actually, is this part that deals with, sorry, uh, with how to deal with the crisis of validation, uh, and also the second portion on understanding the, the etiology of drug disorder. So here, th this is really a precursor of RDOC. Uh, th these elements of the paper are starting to say, uh, perhaps we should be looking, we, except the fact that we cannot create a truly uh, um, comparable animal model of the human condition. And indeed, the human condition is so complex, it should be broken down into its component uh, elements. And then if we could understand the neurobiology of an element like hedonia or anhedonia, perhaps we would make some insights into developing uh, a better understanding of, of psychiatric illness and the better chance of developing new drugs. Um, and the validation crisis, of course, is the fact that we, we, we don't really understand what we're trying to model in many instances, and, uh, and this is also a barrier to, to success. At this point, I want to interject a, a, a few of my own concerns about the way in which we develop animal models. Um, and that is that I don't, uh, I mean, this paper makes a very important point in, in appealing to the use of complex uh, psychological uh, insights of the kind that we've heard from the, the speakers in the first session. But I also, th uh, and so it's whole brain, whole, whole animal. Uh, but in our rush to understand the genetics of, uh, of um, psychiatric disorders and how you model those, I think we've lost sight, really, of the nature of biology in a, an interactive world, and that is, the animals are raised inappropriately. In many conditions, the animals may be housed singly or 
ideally together, but most animal experiments that I'm aware of are actually conducted in the light part of the light-dark cycle. So we know that disturbance of sleep is one of the major contributors to psychiatric illness, yet we persist in testing animals in the phase of their activity cycle when they're least active. Makes no sense. We're also highly uh, dependent upon, obviously, genetic models which, in which the immunity of the animal is suppressed. And also, uh, there's an, uh, a tendency uh, to use animals that are completely germ-free, practically. And we're learning now that the microbiome is an extremely important contributor to a healthy brain. And yet, we're raising animals in a context where the microbiome is probably totally abnormal. So we who advocate for animal models should be thinking more deeply about the environment in which the animals live and how appropriate that is as a model of the human condition. Just a couple of uh, controversial <laughs> uh, insights there. Um, so the other uh, aspect of this, uh, the last point, the impact of preclinical models on a, of a dimensional rather than a syndromal approach. This again, I made the point, it's the RDOC approach. So here in this one paper, uh, we find, I think, the agenda and, and the, uh, the advice about how to move forward in seeking animal models for uh, psychiatric disorder. The other thing that comes through in this paper, and we've seen it in the first set of uh, talks, is um, a deep belief that of all the animal models that we have access to, the animal models for addictive behavior are probably the most robust, the most relevant, the ones that have the highest construct of validity as well as predictive ability. And it's my own deep uh, belief that the real payoff in, in, in showing that the, the investment in basic neuroscience and its uh, advances in clinical practice are actually going to come in the area of addiction research. Um, and so Athena, I know, believed in that very deeply. Um, <coughs> The other thing that came out of all this work, uh, and you in the United States are well aware of this, is a series of really insightful funding programs that the NIH uh, was involved in, including the Matrix uh, Initiative to try to understand which aspects of cognition we should be trying to model in our complex uh, animal approaches. Because, of course, we realize now that cognition is a fundamentally important uh, uh, biomarker in a sense or a marker of uh, the, um, uh, the human condition. And, and these pro I really admire these programs. The, the final point that I wanted to make was a personal one, and it relate it's already been covered by George. It's another deep insight uh, that Athena had right from her earliest days, and George has uh, summarized it beautifully, and that is the importance of these opponent processes, um, whether it's an, uh, an adaptation within a system or between systems adaptations. I actually think that these insights are going to be uh, a key to understanding uh, the nature of depression and the way in which we... Th there's a hope built into this, and that is that if these systems are uh, in uh, a stasis condition, it may be possible, as we're seeing with ketamine and perhaps deep brain stimulation, to actually move somebody out of a depressive state. It's not a lifelong sentence. It, these systems may be modifiable. So I'm going to leave on that optimistic note and uh, thank uh, everyone for the opportunity to be here with you. And uh, just to say how much, as with everyone in this room, I miss Athena's presence. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>